I don't want to dive too much into it just in case you want to go into it blind like I did, which I think is the best way to do it. I mean, I'm into it, so I'm not complaining. Do you think that Sarah J Mass watches our YouTube videos reviewing her books? I love Bryce. She is such a badass. If I was going to annotate this book, here is what I would tag. Like many other fans of Sarah J Mass, I am preparing for the February 15th release of book two in the Crescent City series. So to prepare, I am reading book one, of course. I have never read it before, but I am in the progress of reading the A Court of Thorns and Roses or Akatar series. And I am up to the point where I need to read A Court of Silver Flames but I refuse to read it before I can buy it paperback because it has to match the rest of my series. So waiting for that one. So in the meantime, I am reading House of Earth and Blood. I am new to fantasy. And when I say that, I need to reiterate, I am completely new to fantasy. So a lot of this review is kind of a newbie to the genre. So either you're gonna hate it or you're gonna love it because you're also new or remember what it's like to be new, but that is where my perspective is coming from. I just don't like to say that I dislike a certain genre. I like to be open-minded and there's always books that I'm going to enjoy. I can't just blanket them in one category and say I don't like anything like that. I'm just finding out what kind of fantasy I like or dislike so I can better articulate it and find books that I'm likely to enjoy. Um, but so far with Akatar, I really liked it. So I felt confident that I would enjoy the Crescent City series. I will say that one thing that shocks the hell out of me is that when I go to my local bookstore and I look at the Akatar series, often it is categorized in the young adult section. And that was really confusing to me because there is some spice in there that I would be mortified if I gave it to a young adult to read. So really confused about that. When I asked the girl at the bookstore, she said it was because the main character, Feyre, is like 19 at the start of the books. So that's why they put that there. But I don't know, guys. I don't know. So House of Earth and Blood is in the adult fantasy section, so I was really curious to see if I would notice a difference. Part one is called The Hollow and takes us up through page 90. I'll say off the bat, this comes at us with a punch to the gut that I was not expecting. Although maybe I should have expected it if I actually like read the synopsis on the back, but I didn't do that. I was going into this blind. So out the gate, a lot more emotion involved in this. It is darker, it is grittier, there's a lot of F-bombs, there's a lot of talk of drugs and alcohol. I mean, I'm into it, so I'm not complaining. So I can see why this one would lean more adult. Akatar was a great fantasy series to introduce myself to the genre. We start off with a human that then integrates into this fey world. So your introduction to the fantasy elements is kind of gradual along with our human character. In Crescent City, you just dive right into it and there is a lot going on. It's kind of like taking a drink from a fire hose and I was really confused. All the different creatures, all the different political elements and abilities of people, I still don't know what's going on. Part one was kind of difficult for me. It started getting better, um, started making sense. If I have to recall those details though, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. So um, I think it'll all come together. Um, a lot of world building, I guess, that didn't quite resonate with me yet, but um, I'm sure I'll get there. Part two is called The Trench, and it will take me up through page 366. So it's a long section. Um, and that's the part that I'm in right now. My initial reactions are that, I don't know what's going on with Fury. I have some questions, and I'm gonna need to keep an eye on that one. Um, but I love a confident, badass, calculated, character and that's what Bryce is so far in the start of this section so I am really enjoying it I kind of don't want to put it down um we're just getting started with the action I know what's going on in the world so I'm ready to keep rolling on this one super excited what's gonna happen
time for dinner, but I don't want to stop. So here we are. And yes, yes, you did fuck up. It is Saturday night and I just, oops, don't mind that. I just read this awesome quote in the book right here on page 316. Let me read it to you. See, that right there is the problem. You and the whole rest of the world seem to think I exist just to find someone like him. That of course I can't be genuinely not interested because why wouldn't I want a big strong male to protect me? Surely if I'm pretty and single, the second any powerful banner shows interest, I'm bound to drop my panties. In fact, I didn't even have a life until he showed up. Never had good sex, never felt alive. You tell him, girl. I love Bryce, she is such a badass. I finished part two last night and I really enjoyed it. I don't wanna to dive too much into it just in case you want to go into it blind like I did, which I think is the best way to do it. The story is really taking shape into a mystery. We are investigating a series of crimes and it's going really well. I feel like when it comes to fantasy, the storyline, at least in the ones I've been exposed to, are, I have powers. Oh, I have powers too. Let's have a war. And I'm just kind of burnt out on that. Having a mystery that we're investigating with our dynamic duo here is pretty awesome. The romance is a slow burn, so no spice has happened yet, but I really like the sexual tension that we have between our two characters and Seeing their funny banter, they don't necessarily get along right off the bat. It's not love at first sight. So they have a lot of banter because they don't really like each other, but they don't know each other either. So we go through their banter as they get to know each other and build a friendship. And I think that's really fun to follow along with. There's also elements of foreshadowing in this, which help keep you engaged and make it such a page turner. For example, we know that Bryce went to this Oracle when she was 13 and it was this big reveal, but we don't know what the oracle said. So it's kind of implied at the beginning that it was this dramatic moment in her life, but you're going through part two not knowing what it was. So there's lots of little drops of foreshadowing in this, which really pique my curiosity to keep going. One thing I really enjoy in books is the exploration of grief. It's a very human emotion and battle, and it's kind of universal. A lot of us are going to experience grief in our lifetime, and I think it's so beautiful to see the different perspectives and how people deal with it. And House of Earth and Blood definitely has that. Bryce is recovering from a traumatic event in her life, and we see how she is dealing with her grief, along with her circle of friends. In a lot of other YouTube reviews and videos, I'm seeing a lot of other people mention that the pacing is really slow for this, and I don't necessarily agree, at least with my experience. Of course, this is a longer book, so you kind of have to assume that Sarah J Maas is going to dive into character development, world building, really making you understand this environment, and also diving into the political elements, which are going to play a part. I think you can also tell that she is going to spend more time setting this up for future books. So maybe future books will move a little bit quicker when it comes to the plot. So essentially, I didn't have any problems with the pacing of this. I also watched a video by Brittany the Bibliophile. She was doing a video on A Court of Silver Flames, and she mentioned something that I think is spot on. She said Sarah J Mass loves to write characters at their lowest point, and kind of showing their mental health journey. And I can see that here with Bryce. Just like I can see it with Farah. I haven't read Throne of Glass, so I don't know what's going on there. But just like in A Court of Mist and Fury, when Feyre kind of is at her lowest, lowest point, she's super depressed, how she kind of shuts down and deals with that, and then comes out of the other side. That is very similar to Bryce. She is dealing with grief, going through it, and I'm pretty confident she's gonna come out at the other end. She is definitely painted to be a very intelligent character. And that's one way she differs from Farah. and I think that this is a lot more my kind of heroine than Farah. I found Farah very insecure and not in control of her emotions. And Bryce, damn, she knows who she is. She is calculated, she is witty, she is intelligent, and her banter is hilarious. She is just a lot more confident and sure of herself. Maybe because she's older and she's more experienced than Farah, but uh, this is my kind of heroine. 
Okay, that is enough chit chat. I want to dive into part three. Does anyone else imagine Therian from chapter 42 to look like this? If not, don't ruin the dream for me. This is the image I'm going with. Do you think that Sarah J Mass watches our YouTube videos reviewing her books? If I was an author, I would be so terrified to see everybody picking apart my book. Well, don't worry, Sarah J, I love your book. Okay, part three, The Canyon. I am still loving Bryce. I love how Bryce is confident in her sexuality and she flirts to get what she wants. I think it's super cute and entertaining. As a result, she does face some slut shaming and bullying, which, I mean, she does have a history of promiscuity, so I can see how she gets that reputation, but it still really bums me out. When I say she is an intelligent character, though, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a part in the book where she says that she doesn't mind that people have a certain idea of her being promiscuous and a party girl. Uh, they can believe whatever they want because it gives her an opportunity to look at their character and judge them accordingly. I think that is so insightful and I just really love her for that. In part three, I was really wondering when magic stuff would start happening. It seemed like the fantasy of this book was really centered around the different creatures that were there and we know they have certain abilities, um, but there hasn't been like a lot of magic. I guess up to this point, so I was really wondering when that would kick in. Okay, I'm not gonna spoil anything, but chapter 54 had such a sweet, vulnerable scene that really made me tear up, and it was just so beautiful. I really like to see it. I could dive more into my reaction on it, but I think it's best if you just experience it for yourself. Be prepared that as you're finishing up part three, which is at about page 609, you are not going to want to put this book down. You need to be sure it is like the start of your weekend so that you're not up until midnight. I speak from personal experience because our plot is really taking off. There is a ton of reveals and plot twists and it just kind of blew my mind. I had to keep going. I didn't want to put it down. So be prepared that if you're reading it and you're closing out part three, uh, you're going to keep going at any cost. Part four is called The Ravine, and it starts coming off of a major plot twist. And so it's very action-packed at this point, as I mentioned. Um, this is where it really comes together. So those reviews that I'm seeing complaining about the slow pacing, this is why, because there is no way this will have as emotional of an impact on you if you didn't have that foundation there of why our characters love Crescent City, um, if you didn't have a solid connection to a lot of the characters and understood their motivations, you build this connection with them. You've been with these characters for hundreds and hundreds of pages. So when things happen to them, you feel it. You really feel something on every single page of this part. And it's because Sarah J Mass set it up this way and led you to this point. Of course, in true Sarah J Mass fashion, we have our dark and brooding protective male. It's something that I kind of like in books, but it has to be done a certain way. And at times in the Akatar series, I did not enjoy it um, because our couples kind of turned out to be very codependent and needy and kind of based off this like protective male. In this book, our females are really the powerhouses 
that are saving the day, right? There's not necessarily a knight in shining armor, like they are badasses on their own. So I really thought the protective mail was done well here. It wasn't overbearing, it wasn't controlling. Um, it was sweet and done exactly the way I love them to be written. Speaking of comparing House of Earth and Blood to the Avatar series, like I said, the couple here I liked a lot more. They were more independent and maintained their own identities. They were both powerhouses in their own rights. They took care of each other. So I liked seeing that here versus in Avatar. Um, it just kind of made me roll my eyes a lot, kind of the neediness and the whininess and I mean I love them don't get me wrong but there were just more moments where I was kind of cringing. Additionally I think the vibe of Akatar, while there's still a lot of battles and stuff it is a lot more of a fluffy feel-good read uh, whereas this one I felt so many more emotions. My heart was ripped out on more than one occasion and then now I'm like so up and put back together and yet I still feel hollow. I think I have like such a heavy book hangover from this. I spent so many pages with these characters and I I miss them. I really do. Now that I finished the book, um, it's just, I feel empty. I'm very excited for the next book because I'm not ready to say goodbye to them. So I have a couple weeks to wait for that. I am ready. I think that kind of sums up my reaction to the book. I loved it, if you couldn't tell. Um, like I said, it was super emotional. I wasn't expecting to cry as much as I did, and I mean, I ugly cried. I was sobbing, I was <gasps> gasping, uh, it was just, it was intense. If I was going to annotate this book, here is what I would tag. I mentioned there are a lot of elements of foreshadowing, so that would definitely be something that I would mark. And maybe someone that's smarter than me can help me understand, but if we are doing a flashback alluding to something that happened that's going to be relevant for something in the future, is that still foreshadowing? I don't know, but there's a lot of that, so I would be tagging that. One of the primary themes of this book was grief, so I would definitely tag things that had to do with grief or even the resulting vengeance. Obviously you have to tag Bryce being a badass, because there's a lot of that in here. I think it would be really helpful to tag things that had to do with the political structure of the world. So the different houses and the creatures that fall into that, maybe the different ones that get along and don't, because I highly suspect that's gonna be important in the future. Probably a war at some point going on, if I really had to guess, because that's just how fantasy goes. I would also probably tag instances of discrimination and stereotyping. We definitely see a lot of that in House of Earth and Blood, and I've seen similar things in the Akatar books, so that might be a common thing for her to write, uh, but you see that when it comes to talking about Bryce being a party girl, you have the reputation of being a bastard child, um, of being a half-breed, and the resulting discrimination from those stereotypes. Finally, if I were to read this again, I would definitely be annotating the different examples of friendship, kindness, and loyalty. Those were not necessarily things that I expected to be so prevalent in this book, but it's what made it so incredibly moving for me. The focus was not necessarily on the romance. There's definitely romance here, there's some steam, but What's so touching to me was the loyalty between the friendships and how they take care of each other, how they stand up for each other. It was just so beautiful. And those are the elements that just meant so much to me and uh, honestly made me cry like a little baby. So uh, those are things that I would definitely tag in this. And they, it almost makes me want to read it again just to experience those moments and see how many tags I can put in here because it was just brilliant. That concludes this reading vlog for A House of Earth and Blood. I'm really excited for book two in the Crescent City series. Um, I enjoyed it. I kind of enjoyed comparing it to Akatar. I'm excited for House of Silver Flames, which is the next book I have to read in that series. Uh, so I think I would say yes, I am definitely a Sarah J Mass fan. Um, I like the adult fantasy. Uh, but it just kind of depends on what I'm in the mood for. Light and fluffy, feel good. I'm gonna lean more towards Akatar. If I want um, more emotional connections to the characters, I'm gonna go for probably Crescent City. Um, 
So yeah, thanks for watching. If you've watched up to this point, drop a comment down below with, let's say the moon emoji, because it kind of looks like this crescent, right? Kind of goes for that. So if you've stuck with me this long through all my corny jokes and all my different reactions, please leave that emoji at the bottom. Thank you so much for watching and joining me on this journey. This was so much fun to film and I hope to see you on this channel soon. Bye.